Hi, welcome back to my blog Eddie's English Literature. I am Ardhan Dude. Today we are going to read Dr. Johnson's literary criticism on Shakespeare, particularly his part of the edition that he published, where he put a foreword or a kind of a preface. And that preface is a critical treatise, in fact, a first critical analysis of Shakespearean plays from a judicial point of view. Mm. impartial point of view a comprehensive guide uh, to literary criticism uh, particularly uh, judging the Shakespearean dramas so as a student we should read that treatise as a critical overview on Shakespearean dramas uh, the treatise that he has published or the preface that he has written stuffed with collective information analysis and uh, those are intertwined and intermingled with each other and these are quite difficult for literary students to point out the exact points that uh, Dr. Johnson has arguably forwarded in this treatise or argument. So we should better um, classify this particular article into some sections and for better understanding we should put all these arguments in a particular design so that uh, we can get uh, Dr. Johnson's argument convincingly and understand its uh, argumentative technique as well as his argumentative features and his saying particularly on Shakespearean dramas in a nutshell. So here is the point of view uh, that he has expressed. I have discussed here minutely the different sections. Uh, it is quite um, beneficial for students for understanding. I am also giving some textual reference so that you can better venture into the text and understand it by line by line. Dr. Samuel Johnson's preface to Shakespeare is an epoch-making work. 18th century writer Samuel Johnson is one of the most significant figures in English literature. His fame is due in part a widely read biography of him written by his friend James Boswell, which was published in 1791. Although probably best known for compiling his celebrated dictionary, Dr. Johnson was an extremely prolific writer who worked in a variety of fields and forms, and his literary criticisms are most exquisite examples of his learnedness and prolific understanding of texts. The works on Shakespeare that is notably known as Dr. Johnson's preface to the plays of William Shakespeare is a classical document on English literary criticism. The principles and analytical point of view, the excellences and the defects of the great Elizabethan dramatist William Shakespeare's work has been seen in a new light by his criticism. Earlier, so-called critical ideologies that have been so prevalent of understanding William Shakespeare has been seen in a new light in his critical writing. Johnson, in fact, rejects the previous belief of the classical unities and establishes a more natural theory on what makes drama more prolific and more working and appealing. That is, it should be faithful to life. That kind of vision and that kind of acknowledgement he considers while understanding William Shakespeare's plays. Now, if we try to point out the different criterion of his understanding on Shakespeare that he has notably mentioned in his preface can be summed up in different categories.
first of all Shakespeare's characters. He says Shakespeare's characters are a just representation of human nature as they deal with passions and principles which are common of humanity. They are also true to the age, sex, profession to which they belong and hence the speech of one cannot be put in the mouth of another. His characters are not exaggerated. Even when the agency is supernatural, the dialogue is as par with life. So his characters are never beyond the boundaries of acceptance. So his characters were lifelike. That kind of explanation Johnson prefers in his explaining the characters of William Shakespeare. In fact, he further states that Shakespeare's plays are a storehouse of practical wisdom and from them one can formulate the very philosophy of life. Moreover, his plays represent the different passions, not love or hate alone. In fact, his is the place that mirrors life. While analyzing Shakespeare's use of tragic comedy, Johnson has explained quite critically the different mixtures of tragic comedies that are found in Shakespeare's plays. He has just put the criticism on Shakespeare that why is this mixture? But even he put that in question, he defends him while mixing all these tragic and comic scenes. Johnson says that in mixing tragedy and comedy, Shakespeare has been true to nature because even in real life, there is a mingling of good and evil, joy and sorrow, tears and smiles. This may be against the classical rules as it has been said by Aristotelian understanding in his poetics or from the great classical writers of, of Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides. But there is always an appeal open to call this kind of appreciation or this kind of criticism uh, can be taken into granted that there is an equal opportunity of experiments from every writer and that experimentation has been successfully done by William Shakespeare. Further he points that tragic comedy even it is nearer to life combines within itself the pleasure and instruction of both tragedy and comedy. So, tragicomic scenes does not weaken the effect of tragedy because it does not interrupt the progress of passions. In fact, Shakespeare knew that as Dr. Johnson says that pleasure consisted in variety. Continued melancholy or grief is often not pleasing. Shakespeare had the power to move whether to tears or laughter. So Shakespeare has used these tragicomic scenes or rather comedy or rather corruption of comedy in tragic scene is rather a chemical reaction to that of catharsis.
in analyzing Shakespeare's comic genius, Johnson has said that comedy came natural to Shakespeare. He seems to produce his comic scenes without much labor, and these scenes are durable. Hence, their popularity has not suffered with the passing of time. The language of his comic scenes is the language of real life, which is neither gross nor even refined, and hence it has not grown obsolete. So it has not the burden of obscenity, neither it is elevated like that of over refined. It is as per life. Dr. Johnson says that Shakespeare writes tragedies with great appearance of toil and study, but there is always something wanting in his tragic scenes. His tragedy seems to be skilled, but his comedy, like that of an instinct. While analyzing Dr. Johnson's defense of three unities, or rather Shakespeare's use of three unities, Johnson has said that neither in tragedy nor in comedy, the classical rules of unities to be followed in a strictest sense had no compulsion. So, the only unity Shakespeare needs to maintain in his histories is the consistency and naturalness in his characters and this he does so faithfully. In his other works, which is not based on historical dramas, he has well maintained the unity of action. Shakespeare's plots have the variety and complexity of nature, but have a beginning, middle, and an end. And one event is logically connected with another, and the plot makes gradual advancement towards the denouement. Doctor says that Shakespeare shows no regard for the unities of time and place and according to Johnson, these have troubled the poet more than it has pleased his audience. The observance of these unities is considered necessary to provide credibility to the drama. But any fiction can never be real and the audience knows it beforehand. If a spectator can imagine the stage to be Alexandria and the actors to be Antony and Cleopatra, he, doctor says, he can surely imagine much more. So, Dr. Johnson says that drama is a delusion and that delusion has no limits. Therefore, there is no absurdity in showing different actions in different places. So the unity of time, place and action that the Greek tragedians have maintained or rather followed in strictest sense has no burden for Shakespeare and that has been appreciated by Dr. Johnson. As regards the unity of time, Shakespeare says that the drama imitates successive actions and just as they may be represented as successive places, so also they may be represented at different periods separated by several days. The only condition is that the events must be connected with each other. So Shakespeare saying through his dramas is quite understandable and justified by Dr. Johnson. Johnson further deals with this argument 
and says that drama moves us not because we think it is real but because it makes us feel that the evils represented may happen to ourselves. Imitations produce pleasure or pain not because they are mistaken for reality but because they bring realities into our mind. Therefore, unity of action alone is sufficient. The other two unities arise from false assumptions. So, his argument is quite convincing, or rather, he convincingly said in, his, in this preface that it is good Shakespeare violates them and violates them for dramatic purposes. He even uh, says that the success of Shakespearean dramas in its full maturity is possible as he sometimes distorts the manners and mechanism of that great classical rules of three unities. In his preface to Shakespeare, Dr. Johnson finds some faults that Shakespeare writes without moral purpose and is more careful to please than to instruct. There is no poetic injustice in his place. This fault cannot be excused by the barbarity of his age for justice is a virtue independent of time and place. So when Shakespeare be judged beyond Elizabethan period, where is Shakespeare, the person or the author is universally acclaimed one, then this kind of hair splitting judgment quite appreciating. And Dr. Johnson thus says that the poetic justice that are sometimes missing in William Shakespeare is a major fault in him. Next, taking into his plots, he again complains that Shakespearean plots are loosely formed and only a little attention would have given improving them. Shakespeare simply neglects the opportunities of instruction that his plots offer. In fact, he very often neglects the later parts of his plays and so his catastrophes often seemed quite forced or rather improbable. Again, Dr. Johnson finds faults of chronology and many anachronism in his place. Shakespeare's use of jokes that are sometimes gross and listen to us and his narration, there is much form of diction, circumlocution, even tedious. Dr. Johnson argues that they are often verbose and too large for thought. Trivial ideas are clothed in sonorous epithets. He is too fond of puns and squibbles which engulf him in mire. For a pun, he sacrifices reason, propriety and truth. He often fails at moments of great excellence. Some contemptible conceit spoils the effect of his pathetic and tragic scenes and he gives some references to this. But notably, the merits of Shakespeare are acknowledged by Dr. Johnson in this critic. He says a great page on the use of blank parts, the diversified, the flexible and which is closer to be approached makes an excellent entry into the English language. And that kind of argument can be. Dr. Johnson tells the very merit of use of blank verse by William Shakespeare. The diversity, the flexibility, 
with huge Shakespeare has used these kind of blank parts in his dramas make it an entry into the prolific understanding of the language and its beautification the blank verse which shakespeare has brought it near to be a prose is a genius like shakespeare that has made it possible so dr johnson is in full praise of it we will now see a few of the texts whereby we can make some critical comments on the observation of dr johnson on this preface to shakespeare and this understandably will lead us a further and close reading of this particular critic Johnson uh, has arguably put forward all these uh, measured techniques of judging William Shakespeare and its plays from impartial point of view, from judicial point of view. He has uh, taken the liberty of judging Shakespeare the person uh, devoid of his, his faults because many of the faults that uh, we really consider as Shakespeare's is the editorial mistake. So he has um, made it Uh, different categories that uh, the editorial corruptions or editorial uh, mistaken uh, that are making Shakespeare's understanding a quite a bit difficult. He has pointed out all those things and minutely measured the techniques that has primarily Shakespeare employed to make his audience entertained. So his arguable technique or judging the Shakespeare from the point of view of making a collective ideology on which Shakespeare the person the dramatist can be understood better is being first made by this Dr. Johnson who is um, better known as Dr. Johnson or Dictionary Johnson because his great caliber in English language and literature is his compilation of that great voluminous dictionary that has made the possibility of English in its flourishment in its uh, readily making learnedness. So thank you for patient reading as well as understanding uh, the basic criterion by which Dr. Johnson has put forward his preface and it is better uh, to make the original text reading uh, to understand William Shakespeare better and arguably understand Dr. Johnson's point of view. But that kind of opportunity we hardly have because the text is quite difficult and comprehensive. Uh, you, you, have to, you have to understand or grasp the entirety of this experience in place before you venture into the, uh, the very critique of Dr. Johnson. So, as a student, uh, this kind of lecture or this kind of topic uh, that point out uh, the, the different, uh, different key features in Dr. Johnson's writing will make a help to get a better understanding of this literary critic. So, thank you for watching. Like, share, comment and don't forget to subscribe. Bye-bye.